¿Tú me dices cuándo, Sergio? Digo, ¿tú me dices cuándo me leció? ¿Listo? Ok, vamos a ver cuántos hay. ¿Dejas entrar a todo el mundo? Ok, vamos a esperar un tantito. ¿Cuántos tenemos? ¿Setenta? ¿Ya estamos en vivo? Sí. Ok, eh, muy buenas tardes a todo el mundo. Good afternoon, everybody. Hoy tenemos eh, un gran programa, eh, nuevas alternativas para lentes intraoculares fijados a esclera. Tenemos dos profesores invitados increíbles. Eh, tenemos al doctor Sergio Canabrava de Brasil y el doctor Matthew Ward de eh, Provo, Utah, en los Estados Unidos. La agenda, vamos a empezar eh, con el doctor Canabrava en un momento, con su técnica eh, de fijación de lentes en esclera. Después, eh, el doctor Luis Valdés, uno de los fellows que tenemos aquí en CODET, eh, va a presentar la técnica usando el modelo biónico. A seguir, el doctor Matthew Ward con su técnica de lente suturado esclera, lente en vista. Posterior a esto, la doctora Andrea Montero, también fellow de CODET, nos va a mostrar la técnica del doctor Ward usando el modelo biónico y después vamos a tener eh, tiempo para preguntas y respuestas. Este, nos podemos alargar lo que la gente quiera. Y, y bueno, este, sin más que decir, este, quisiera eh, empezar presentando al... Bueno, al doctor eh, Canabrava. El doctor Canabrava es actualmente staff de Santa Casa de Belo Horizonte. Él este, vive en, en Brasil, en la ciudad de Belo Horizonte, en Minas Gerais. Es ex jefe del departamento de Catarata, el centro oftalmológico de Minas Gerais. Y él ha desarrollado muchos, eh, muchas cosas recientemente, como es el Canabrava Ring y el Double Flange Polypropylene Suture, y bueno, este, Sergio, bienvenido, uh, welcome, and I'm going to stop sharing. You can start sharing your screen, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much for, for being with us tonight. Arturo, yes. thank you for the invitation. For me, it's an honor to, to talk to, to, to Codect and to talk for, to Mexico. I think my first... I did a lot of webinars around the road in this pandemic uh, era, but I think from Mexico is the first one. And uh, let's go to, and you today you have 20 minutes. You told me this, this time, then I can present everything about the double fleshed suture. And let me start it. Okay. Uh, Some surgeons uh, knows only about uh, the four flange technique, but what start everything was the double flange. And now I will share my screen and show about the double, double flange technique. Can you see? Yes, yes, yes? perfect. Okay. Okay, here my disclosure about this, this, this talk. And when did it all begin? Uh, in 2016, when I saw the, the Yaman technique, the flanged, I was working in my city in Belo Horizonte in the challenge case uh, ambulatory. And in Brazil, you don't have Gore-Tex. Gore-Tex for us here is so expensive and difficult to use. And you have before the double flange only the 10-0 polypropylene sutra. Then I had the idea, this was the first double flanged surgery. Some, some people uh, know about the 5-0, but two, uh, I had the idea in the about the 5-0 polypropylene sutra, first with this, this haptic. He was the, the first double flanged suture in 2016. 
uh, somebody think, oh, Sergio, you, you developed it uh, in the last year. No, I start to use the double flange in 2016. The first time I used it was with a simple haptic from IOL, as you can see, and using a flat CTS. Then it was the first surgeon that I received a prize in 2017 in uh, Los Angeles in the ASCIS uh, Film Festival. And observe, the first way I had the idea to produce the double flange it was with a short polypropylene that I get from a simple haptic from a IOL. And then here, the technique is the same that I do today, but observe, the flange is inside the eye. And then you can observe, I insert the 5-0 polypropylene suture inside the, the needle, a 26 gauge needle. I remove it from the eye and then I do the second flange and then for this first time, I published the double flanged suture. Now I'm inserting the IOL inside the capsule bag. And then insert the second flange in the tunnel. Okay, then I published it in 2017, received a prize in the SCIS Film Festival, but has everyone lived happily ever after? No, observe, this, this surgery that gave me the idea to use a simple, a simple 5-0, because in large eyes, it's impossible to use this short, this short port prop plan. Then, late of 2017, I start my tests with 5-0 polypropylene sutra. And nobody was talking about it. Uh, people start to talk it only 2019. And then my first tests, and then I thought, man, I can use an adjustable suture with a simple uh, polypropylene suture. The cost of this polypropylene suture is $3 in Brazil. Okay, and I can adjust it with the size that I want. Then 2018, I present it, this video on ASCIS in like a, a free paper. It's a patient with Marfan syndrome that this was my first surgery that I use a, a simple 5-0 polypropylene suture with adjustable suture. Then here I hydroprolapse the nucleus for the anterior chamber. And then the same technique, but now I have, I have a adjustable suture that I don't need to buy a, a, a IOL. I can use a simple 5-0 polypropylene suture in a, a needle with 26 gauge needle. And then I now I can do the first plunge outside the eye test it, and then I can insert the CTS inside the eye, and then do the second flange. Observe how in this part I'm using three millimeter, now I use two millimeters. And you pay attention to how I don't do a large tune tunnel in my first surgeons, surgeries. Now I suggest a large tunnel because you develop in the technique. Okay, then I published in the JCIS, and it was the, the most popular uh, paper for two or three months, and it received a Golden Apple Prize uh, in 2019 in San Diego. Okay, now I will present for you the, the, the Golden Apple Prize. It's about two, two patients. The first one, two patients with microspherophagia, the first one, teach me about the second one. Uh, my first question, do you think it's a fake news? It's uh, in my hospital, my hospital, Arturo and Matt, you have catalysis, you don't have Lensex here. And it's a catalysis report 
Do you think it's a fake news or it's a real, real Qatar's report? Look the position no. of the of the the crystalline, and it's a real, not fake news. Observe after after the 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 femtosecond. This the the place where the crystalline is. And Dr. Canabrava, how did you levitate it? I had the idea because microsphere faker, there is a zone pre preserver to use a air bubble behind, behind the crystalline and their bubble levitated for me. There is no vitros. There is no vitros. Observe how the zone. And then I was hold the crystalline. Look the green arrow. How the their bobo levitated for me for me, and I grasp I, I hold the crystalline, but I could to to perform this fake classification. No, so went to the vitrectomy. I need to do a vitrectomy and do a square out fixation. But what did I learn from this case? This is an important point that I I, I learned. The size of the CTS, the size of the CTR. I was with a, a one patient with microsphero fascia, and the and the crystalline has about eight millimeter diameter. And I was trying to insert a CTR with 12, 10 millimeters. It's not matter. Never, never we fit inside the bag. Then I, I call for a company from India, and they produce for me. A, CT, a CTR with 10, 8 millimeter. And I went for the second eye. You can observe, set seven, eight millimeters. Okay, this eye is, is less subluxated, but is a, a, a so, uh, so hard case to observe. Here, I don't need to do a, a, a air bubble, but observe, I use a four macro hooks, so sorry, a four iris hook, in patients, uh, young patients, I prefer to use my uh, uh, iris rook. Then in my protocol, I use uh, OVG visco to create a space. And now observe with a right, uh, a per perfect side of the CTR, I can insert the CTR inside the bag. I like to use a simple Sinsky rook to insert it inside the bag. I don't like to use the injector. I have more control with my hands. And then a fake emulsification. I like to hydroprolapse this nucleus to the anterior chamber. And then after, after to remove the, the crystalline and after to remove the cortex, in my routine, I remove first the left side and I like to use a simple hook to create, to create a space between the iris and the CTR. All my, my, my subluxated cataract, I use CTR first, first, phantom second, flex, CTR, then I use the double flange. Then a 26 gauge needle, I insert it inside inside the, the lumen of the needle. It's a 5-0 polypropylene. It's 10 times thicker than the 10-0 and 100 times more hesitant. And then the first flange it for the first time, I insert the CTS, the capsule tensile segment inside the bag. Then I repeat the procedure, put the movement in the other side the same movement, you can see the same. I, I suggest to use a new needle because it's better to insert, create a tunnel. I do the first, uh, first, the first uh, flange it for the, the second time, insert the second CTS, and then I put the two CTS in the position. And now I'm able to, to cut the two polypropylene now 
with two millimeters and do the second flange for the first time. I do the second flange for the second time. And now I'm able to insert the flange inside the tunnel and able to insert the IOL in the bag, as you can see. And observe in the end of the knots how the flange is important to, ins to be inside the tunnel. Okay, here the UBM and the anterior CT that you can see the flange in the right position inside the sclera. And here the review of the technique. 0 polypropylene suture, CTR, uh, a thermoculture, and a, a, a CTS, and a 26 gauge needle. Here, uh, the case that I have, I have more case with a subluxated, with a trauma eyes, with a Marfan, and it's, it's in. Here, uh, an important point that I, I need to to, to advise you, if you do, if you do, if you do a large, a large uh, flange, as you can see in the left side, in the left size, you can, you can, you can create a conjunctival erosion or a endophthalmy. Then in the, the right side, after the treatment, I use five days of, of uh, mox floxacin. I back for the operate room and I did a small one to solve this problem. In my protocol, flex, CTR, hydroprolapsed the nucleus, CTS plus double flange. And I like to say this double flange suture open and uh, change the game because only 2019 and uh, many surgeons around the world uh, using this this double flanged suture to create many, many techniques. And now I will stop to sharing. And after I will, we will start to, to discuss about the four flanged. One minute. If you want to ask anything, okay. Now. Take your time. Sergio, we'll have uh, questions at the end of the... Yes, yes, I mean, I, 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 I open only the four flanges. Yes. Because first... Okay, can you see my four flanges now? Yes. Then Arturo, uh, I keep researching, okay? This double flange was, as you can see, during 2016, 2017, and in 2018, I, I thought, man, I can use this double flanged suture to fixate IOL in the eye. Then I had the idea late of uh, to, to 2018 to create the four flanged technique and I published it in 2019. The idea was to get a simple, the first, the, the first four flanged, a simple, a simple PMMA single piece IOL that you use in Malbrand technique that you use and in, in, in Lewis technique and create and use a double flanged suture on one side and a double flanged suture in the other side. And then here, the four flanged technique. The steps. First, you, you pass the, the 5-0 polypropylene suture in the scleral tunnel, you do the first and the second flange outside the eye, then you insert the IOL inside the eye in the sucos, like you do in the Lewis and the Malbrand technique, and then you do the third and the fourth flange. Here the video about the fourth flange technique with a, a, a single piece PMMA. Not I'm using here a 5-0 polypropylene suture, and here, I'm doing the first flush, and then I repeat the movement in the other side. And again, I do the second flange, and I insert the IOL in the sucrose. It's important. Look this movement. It's it's straight in the iris because you need to put the IOL in the in the sucrose. And then with the IOL in the right position, because this IOL has a 
30 millimeters overall, you do the, the, the third flange and you do the fourth flange. And this technique, this video was the video most viewed in the AAO website last year. And many, many, many surgeons asking me, Sergio, it's possible to do the fourth flange technique to the foldable OL here, a UBM of this patient. Here in number one, you can see, I can see the 5-0 polypropylene suture and the shadow of the flange. And then the question, everybody asking me, Sergio, it's possible to do a, a fourth flange folded by OL. Then I publish in the IOL a video that I present a IOL punch that you can see video three here. I did a lot of tests in this video. I, in the end of the video, I, 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 ask, uh, I ask for the surgeon, don't do it yet because I'm testing. I'm testing if it's stable or not. But a lot of surgeons don't wait my test and they start to make a role in the IOL. And I don't suggest to make a role in IOL. In my, my hands, maybe another surgeon can have a, 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 good, uh, a good hands and can be it is stable. But in my tests, sometimes be stable, sometimes not be stable. Then I have the idea to create the fourth flange to fold the boy well that to, uh, was published in the JCIS last week. Uh, use it, we use it uh, IOL with four eyelets. In Brazil, have only Acres IOL. But you can use physio, you can use artists because physio in artists is acrylic hydrophobic. Acrylic is acrylic hydrophilic, but in Brazil have only acrylic. And the technique is you need to pour four points techniques. Of course, I have this, this idea inspired in the, in, the, in the four point with Gore-Tex. And I pass the, the see, here I use a 6-0 polypropylene suture because it's not so rigid, okay? It's better than 5-0. I start with 5-0, but for the foldable OL, I suggest to use a 6-0. And then I use a, a, a simple Burrata Ford, so you see in my first video, my next video. And only with the IOL inside the eye, I remove the four points. And then it's important, it's important. Cut the bottom, the bottom of the first and the second. Look, the, se the first, the second, the bottom, then you can adjust the IOL with the up three and the fourth flange. And then it's important to insert it inside the, uh, the nucleus, the, the tunnel. Here, with uh, uh, another patient, that I will show you an interest point that how is interest, how is, is amazing in this technique that you can adjust the IOL inside the eye. Here I did all my tests, I, I, I mark it, observe the tunnel. It's important you create a tunnel in the, in the, in the, in the sclera. When I start the technique, Imagine it. when you start to create new things, you need to improve it. And with these three years, I can I can see how is some points. For example, the tunnel. Then here I remove the six zero. Then subluxated cataract and PMMA IOL five zero. Uh, for I let IOL six zero. Okay. Then I measure two millimeters from the limbus. Again, look my inclination, the tunnel. is important to create the tunnel. And then, again, insert the 6-0 polypropylene suture inside the, the here, a 29 gauge needle, OK? 5-0, 26, uh, 6 zero, 29. And repeat, I repeat the procedure, the procedure, and I insert the polypropylene inside the eyelet Okay, I do it again in the other side. This video, I like this video because this video is, is longer. Then I can uh, discuss more time about the, the technique. 
and observe that I have the, the, the proline in the four lens. Okay, then I mark the two millimeter distance for the first point. I do the third tunnel. I insert the six zero inside the lumen of the IOL of the, the, the needle. And then using a simple burrata forceps or a simple forceps, you, you can insert the IOL into 3.4 millimeters incision, as you can see. But I have only three points. Sergio, why use three points? Because sometimes in my tests, when you pass the four points, uh, the, the, the shooter can cross inside the eye. Then when I, I have one point outside the eye, I avoid the, the shooter cross, uh, cross inside the eye. Then for my surprise, for, for I have a, a big surprise, surprise here, you can observe, I try to adjust the IOL, but observe. The IOL is not in the right position. I try one, I try two, and it's not in the right position. If you have a technique with two points, it's more difficult for you. But one the advantage of this technique, you have four points. And it's not centered. Then what to do? I decide to remove one side, one point, as you can see, my left hand, I, I have my micro forceps. I remove one side and I do this four point again with more space for the other point. Then with more space, observe that I enlarge it because this I like to show this, this, this video because uh, was a, a good option. If the IOL is, is not in the right position, you can remove one. And now you can see how the IOL is well centered. Then I finish the technique with like uh, I show in the first one, but observe, I'm uh, developing the technique. And now I do the flange with a large, and I go to insert it, observe again. I don't, I don't need to, to do a, a small one because I can adjust it. I think the image, I, I don't know if you can see, but if you do a large one, you can adjust, you will, you will pull it to the, the, side, the side the eye. Then again, and now it's important to Pull it a little decentration because you, when you back with the four point, observe the IOL will back for the right position. You need to do it and observe how I'm inserting the IOL, the, the flange, the four flange inside. Observe, you don't see any flange. All flange is inside, it's inside in the IOL in the high position. Okay, here, a video from Dr. Kashikian from Los Angeles. I like this. They, they use the double flanged suture. Here, they, they, he is using a 5-0. I, I chat with him, I talk to him, and it's better to use 5-0. And in my opinion, I don't have human optics here. I, I mean, crazy to have this human optics here to use my technique. I can do my technique with human optics. Uh, but I suggest him to use only four points. In this, this, this time, he uses six points. About my numbers, numbers after uh, 20, 26 months, I have 20, 20, uh, 21 eyes with subluxated cataract, uh, 17 eyes with single piece PMMA, and only eight eyes with foldable IOL accuracy because the, the the, pun, the COVID stopped my research, but it's new technique. Uh, it's safe. Still now seems to be safe, but it's important 
to to keep more follow ups to adjust it. Okay, about the the Acres IOL. Acres IOL. There's some important uh, information with uh, uh, opacification. Then, if you have if you have uh, physio, if you have uh, another uh, uh, hydrophobic IOL, you can use it. Here, my last uh, my last prize in in 2008 2000 this year in the ASCIS Film Festival. A uh, new IOL dev, that I start the research with Mosher, uh, with hydrophobic IOL is an amazing design. If you if you have a ASCIS, uh, uh, you can attend and you can see this video that I received a prize this year. And this is a dog because three years three uh, three weeks ago I received this picture from a. A veterinarian from Brazil, they use the double flange in a dog. But Sergio, what do you think is so interesting in a dog? Because uh, uh, the veterinary, Dr. Pedro, uh, tell me, Sergio, the, the dog's sclera and conjunctiva, there are a lot of a lot of uh, blo blood, is is sangue, uh, and it's impossible for us to uh, create a suture in a in a, a knot in a sclera and before your technique before your technique you couldn't to fixate iol in this in these dogs because dogs there are a lot of subluxate subluxate the cataract and your double flange for us uh, changed the game in the dogs and i i think it was interesting and here and my instagram if you want to follow my Instagram, I every week I, I post one case of my routine. And it's a pleasure if you need to send me some discussion, I like to discuss. And thank you for, for your attention. E, thanks. Thank you, Sergio. This was really, really an amazing presentation. Uh, I really enjoy it and I'm sure everybody enjoy it. And this, uh, your technique, for the dogs is very interesting too. So at the end of, of, the, of the webinar, we will have the questions and answers. I want to go now uh, to the next presentation, which will be by one of our fellows, Luis Valdez, who uh, did your technique using the Bionico model. So very interesting. I hope you like it, uh, Sergio. This is for you. Yes, yes, I want to see. Hello, greetings, yeah. everyone. First of all, I would like to thank our guests for being here with us, sharing their knowledge. And now I will share my screen to present a video I made of our wet lab practices with Dr. Canaprava's technique with Acros IOL. I hope you like it. First, we place marks at the horizontal axis. Then, we place one mark on each side, three millimeters posterior to the limbus. Mark the sternal sides, three millimeters posterior to the limbus, and five millimeters from each other. Create a 3.4 millimeter superior corneal incision. Make the first inferior sclerotomy with a 29 gauge needle and insert the pro lead. Repeat this step on the other side. Insert the nasal end of the suture into the nasal eyelids, from down to up, then 
up to down. And repeat it on the other side. Make the first superior scleroni and insert the proline. Fold and insert the IOL with the burrata's forceps. Make the final scleromy and insert the proline. Center the IOL. Cut the sutures 2 mm from its base. Make the inferior flanges with the portable cautery. Insert the flanges into the scleral tunnels. Final result. Here, on the posterior view, we can appreciate the excellent centration, stability, and symmetry that can be achieved with this technique. Luiz, ela não pode ser em vivo. <risos>
uh, a lot uh, doing uh, surgeries worldwide for uh, needed people. He has traveled to Nepal, Peru, Romania, Moldova, and Ghana. And his special interest is modern endothelial keratoplasty techniques. And as you will see, scleral fi fixation of intraocular lenses. Another uh, ra uh, rising star in the field of uh, fixating IOLs. Uh, Matthew, please, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and uh, welcome and thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you, Arturo. Uh, this is a real honor for me. I really appreciate your invitation. Great opportunity um, also to be on the same program with Sergio. That's quite an honor too. He's such an innovative surgeon. I really enjoyed uh, learning from him and have used his technique and I can I can definitely say it's a, a very useful and, and helpful technique. So um, everything working? You can see everything? Okay, good. Yes. So um, good. So I'll be discussing today uh, transleural fixation of the Invista IOL using Gore-Tex. No financial interest in this presentation, but I will be discussing an off-label use for an FDA-approved device. Uh, that's something in, in the US we have to say. Uh, so, so many techniques for treating aphakia without capsular support. Uh, how do you know which one is best? Uh, well, many, whenever you have a situation where there's so many techniques, there's probably not one that's perfect. Uh, but what would be the perfect technique? Well, it would be conceptually simple, easy to understand, technically easy, and easy to do, easy to teach, uh, and indefinitely stable. It would never have any problems with stability, and there would be no complications with the procedure, and it would be applicable in all scenarios. So this is the holy grail of uh, a sutured eye well technique. Well, I don't presume my technique to be the perfect one, but um, I think there's some aspects, many aspects where it, it can get um, close to being, being very helpful in many situations. Uh, why do I like this technique? Well, first of all, I like that it's a single piece acrylic foldable IOL. We know that this is a very stable lens material, unlikely to opacify, and it can fit through a small clear corneal incision. The hydrophobic material is critical due to the, sometimes patients in these situations, they have to have retina procedures or detachment repairs down the road or other issues, or perhaps endothelial keratoplasty. So we, we're going to use gas in the eye. Uh, it's an aberration neutral IOL like the Acrios, which makes it forgiving to decentrations and has uniform power across the optic. The Gore-Tex suture is, has a strong track record as proven as it is a very good way to fixate to the sclera and is easily visualized, no memory to the suture. The, the technique is flapless, so there's no cumbersome flaps that, or, or suture knots that can erode. A four-point fixation, which uh, is strong and stable. An abexterno approach that makes it very uh, easy to do most of the surgery outside of the eye, and then uh, minimizing risky maneuvers inside the eye. Minimal pupil dilation is required this, as, because most of the work is done outside. Only injection step is, is required to get the lens through the pupil. And finally, which I think is very exciting, is uh, it's an option to fixate a toric IOL for patients with uh, significant corneal astigmatism. And I like that it combines well with DMAC, and, and I've used it successfully many times in, in combination with DMAC with a small incision and good support. So some key, key concepts. Uh, I use a radial orientation of the sutures. Um, if you thread the eyelets of the Invista lens uh, and, and you remove the haptics, which I, I do, it, it will naturally uh, line up uh, in a coronal plane if you, if you attach it to the sclera radially. If you do it tangentially, then it will be perpendicular. Um, some people do tangential fixations, but they keep the haptics in place and they use uh, tension across the haptic to keep the lens in the proper orientation. I don't really like 
the uh, keeping the haptics in place because I found that they can become entangled easily and sometimes make it confusing what you're pulling on when you're when you're uh, pulling the lens, the suture through. So planning any surgery, uh, proper planning for any surgery is very important. And this guy maybe should have planned a little bit better before he started his job. So we want to make sure that we're setting everything up right. Okay, so uh, I start by marking the eye meticulously. I want to know where everything is going to go so that I have a good plan. The most important marks are these tandem uh, blue marks here. I make them 1.5 millimeters from the limbus and then 1.5 millimeters apart, which allows for an approximate 1.5 to 2 millimeter location from the limbus uh, of the lens. Now, um, this is marked as a four millimeter incision, but uh, I now do a technique that you can use a 2.4 or 2.8 incision. So the, the first time I tried this technique, I decided to use a needle docking method. And I've, I've kind of changed, but I'm gonna show you how I started because this is very easy. There's very, there, you could do this now with the equipment you have in your OR. Maybe you don't have micro forceps or some of the more expensive instrumentation, you can do this. So I bend, uh, I start by uh, bending the PT13 needle on the CV8 Gore-Tex, which is a 7.0 Gore-Tex. I bend a 25 gauge needle and then I, I dock them in the middle of the eye. So, so through the posterior sclerotomies, they dock uh, with good visualization and then pulling through the PT13 needle so that you create a thread that runs through the, the central meridian of the eye. And then following that, I do the same thing with the, through the anterior sclerotomies. So you have two parallel Gore-Tex sutures running through the eye. Using a Sinsky hook or a Kuglin hook, I then pull, those, uh, pull a loop of both sutures out through the main incision, thread the Gore-Tex and, and cut each loop. So that leaves th four free ends of Gore-Tex suture. The posterior ends I thread through the eyelet and then you have to reconnect the suture. So you have to tie a bend knot. Um, I just use a very simple overhand bend that rejoins the cut ends of suture. So, and once you've got those bend knots tied, you now have a continuous length of suture running through this, each sclerotomy, through the eyelets and back, back through the uh, opposite sclerotomy. And so now all the suturing is done, the eye well is threaded, and all you have to do is insert it. Uh, Alcon makes this, uh, we call it a wagon wheel folder. I, I don't know why, but uh, it, it will fold the eye well in half. You could just use simple folding forceps as well. But uh, and then inject uh, or insert the eye well through that four millimeter incision. Once it's in the eye, uh, I trim the Gore-Tex on each side and tie the knots one, one, one. If you tie it with more throws than that, or one, two, one, or one, two, two, the knot gets very large and makes it very difficult to rotate, especially through a 25 gauge sclerotomy. So I trim the knot about two millimeters, uh, leave about a two millimeter tail, and then rotate the knots completely in the eye. Very important. And I, some people like scleral grooves. I haven't seen a need to do that with such a small length of Gore-Tex traveling across the sclera. And there's a nice centered Invista IOL there. And then I like to close the conjunctiva with fibrin glue because uh, I think it, it's more comfortable for the patient, but I also think that the glue helps seal the sclerotomies. When I started doing this, I didn't have as much hypotony afterwards. So here's a case using the needle docking method. Uh, one of my vitri retinal, uh, vitro retinal colleagues picks up this dislocated three-piece lens, which in this case, decided to cut and remove from the eye using the Pac-Man technique and removing that eye well. And then here, making the posterior sclerotomies with a 25 gauge needle or, or all of the sclerotomies, I just make them all at once with infusion on uh, to try and keep the globe formed. Here, bending the PT13 needle and then the 25 gauge needle. And then I, I hold the PT13 needle in my dominant hand and the non-dominant hand, I, I insert the 25 gauge needle and 
the needles meet in the middle. You have to kind of push a little bit to make the attachment snug. Otherwise, as you withdraw, that needle can come out of the lumen. And so there's the first length of Gore-Tex and then the second length I could make the sclerotomies at the same time on the left side. Uh, I didn't have to necessarily pre-place those. Um, and then pulling that second length through the anterior sclerotomy. So now there's these parallel strands of Gore-Tex oriented radial to the limbus. Here I cut the haptics. I did this after my first couple of cases because I just realized the haptics just get in the way and there's not a huge need for them, pulling the loop of suture through each, each of them and then cutting so there's four free ends. And here it's, you can get a little lost. It can get confusing which suture is which, but um, there's some learning curve there, but I like to set them, once I've identified the posterior, I set that on the cornea and then I keep the anterior down uh, on the uh, conjunctiva temporally there. So I know which is which. Then I thread the posterior through the eyelet. Make, making the overhand bend, rejoining those lengths of suture. And then I then you have a secure attachment. And I just pull that knot, that large knot all the way through so that that doesn't get in the way. So now there's just a nice continuous thread of Gore-Tex. And do the same with the other side. Maybe we can speed along here a little bit. So now both pulling that knot through, both of them are nicely threaded. Everything's really done and you've hardly been in the eye at all. folding the eye well, and then inserting into the eye. And then you can just pull on each side and that lens is not going anywhere. You're not gonna lose that in the vitreous. Sometimes it can kind of flip upside down, uh, but it'll always turn out right if because you've placed the sutures properly from the beginning. And then tying down one, one, one. And I like the um, second tie, the second throw I usually do a slip knot because this, Right here is the most critical step. Uh, if you don't get proper suture tension, then you will have problems with this technique. Either they'll be too loose or too tight. And we'll talk about that in a minute. And then rotating the knots in the eye will advance a little bit through here for the sake of time. And then this is sometimes the hardest part of the procedure is getting that knot inside the eye. And through a 25 gauge sclerotomy, it's, it can be tricky. But once it's in, it's not going anywhere. So now I'll show you what I'm doing more. I, I don't do the needle docking quite as much. Um, now this is a case of a sutured toric in Vista. Mark the eye just like you would the steep axis of, for any toric case. And in this case, it was the highest amount of toric correction possible. This was a a monocular gentleman with, uh, who attempted an autoenucleation and he succeeded with his right eye. This is his left eye that um, he lost his lens and, and a lot of his iris as well and ended up with a corneal scar that created a lot of astigmatism. So making the tandem marks and move through, you've seen that part of it. So now anterior vitrectomy. And in this case, I use a 23 gauge sclerotomy, so a little bit larger, and that will accommodate 25 gauge microforceps very easily. And I've, I've, I've liked the 23 gauge sclerotomy because it's much easier to rotate the knot. And I have, I have to fiddle with that a lot less. 
cutting the distal haptics. Now here it's different. I just thread a length of Gore-Tex. I cut the needles off of the Gore-Tex and I just thread the length of suture through each side, a generous amount. And then I fold it like I would any, any acrylic single piece lens in a normal injector and inject it in like you're doing a FACO. So it's pre-threaded. And then it's just a matter of pulling on the right lines. So you have to pull, I pull the posterior first. I just felt like that's more simple and I try to do it the same way every time. So I pull on the posterior, then the anterior. And I like to get the leading, the leading haptic secured or the leading eyelet secured first and then push the trailing one in and pull on the posterior one first and then the anterior one. And this, this is a little learning curve. It can get a little confusing at times, but when you've done it a, a couple of times, it's very straightforward. And then tying down one, one, one. And the toric in Vista lines up perfectly along the marks. So it's not right where you suture it is right where those marks will be. So you can be sure that you, you can even be more accurate than you can with a FACO because you're not gonna, not gonna have any lens rotation. Um, and in his, this particular case, he was hand motion vision. He corrected with a plus nine minus five diopters. And I, within, I think, uh, a month, he was 20, 25 uncorrected. And so he was a very happy, uh, uh, very lucky man. Um, and then ro rotating those knots is a lot easier. I like this technique. It looks like you've just done a FACO afterwards, um, the way the, that lens looks in the eye. Um, so Gore-Tex sutured in Vista, what, what complications can occur? This is not a perfect technique. So there, there are complications. Early complications I've seen are hypotony, which I think is less when you use fiber and glue to seal the sclerotomies. Vitreous hemorrhage can occur as with any uh, case where you're, you're making sclerotomies. Uh, Late complications, the, the really most worrisome are the eyelet fracture and the lens wobble. So you can get UGG syndrome if your sutures are too loose. And if they're too tight, the eyelets will fracture and, and it, the lens has to be removed. Gore-Tex exposure can of course occur. I've had one case of exposure where I did not properly rotate the knot, um, but as long as the knots have been rotated at least for five years doing this technique, I've never had a, uh, any exposure of Gore-Tex. So, a slack line. You may have seen people do this sport uh, where they walk along a slack line and it's kind of a loose uh, band of, of uh, webbing that they walk across. And this is too loose. If you have a slack line and you've got an Invista, you can see how much wobble you get. Um, and, and that's going to rub against the iris, maybe cause some chafing. And so here's a case where I had the attachment was too loose. This is a, maybe six months after he had a surgery. He came back and was having recurrent inflammation, IOP elevation, and just a mild UGG syndrome. And I think he may have had a little bit of CME. And so this was not acceptable long-term. So you can have a tightrope where like this man walking across Niagara Falls. So this is too tight. This is stretched so tight that it doesn't even bend when he's walking across. So here is slow motion video of pulling on the eyelets with the Gore-Tex and you can see they stretch quite a bit, but at some point they will snap. And I've had some people trying this technique and, and giving up or being discouraged uh, because they're, they've had it snap on them. And so this is a, a frustrating problem um, that can be remedied with the proper tension. And you can see there one of the fractures of the eyelets. So uh, we am part of a case series that's um, just about to be published, multi-center of 24 cases of uh, eyelet fracture, 20 post-operative, four intraoperative, interestingly. And there's about 90 days mean time to fracture. So if it's gonna fracture, it may not be immediate, but uh, over, over time it can. Um, some people have attributed this to a change in the material the older MX60 material was, was more rigid than, than the current MX60E. 
when they changed to this material, I was pretty upset because I knew it was going to be a little softer. And that case I just showed you where there was wobble was my first in Vista E case because I knew I couldn't suture it too tight and I overcompensated and I left it too loose. Um, but I've now been using the Invista E successfully for a, a while now and I, I, st I still feel like it's a viable technique. Now, what's, what's just the right amount of tension? Well, like these highliners in Moab, Utah, they've, they've, got their, they've got a little bit of tension that's not too, too tight, but it's not a full slack line either. So we want this just right. Here you can see as I stretch the Gore-Tex and I pull on it, it doesn't, there's not a big difference between a loose, too loose, and as soon as you get the right tension, it's very stable. It doesn't wobble, it doesn't move. If you let, let it slack, it starts to wobble. So you really don't need it to be too tight. It just needs to be cinched just enough. So here's that case of that lens wobble again, and what I did. So I took a Sinsky hook, I, I captured the loop of Gore-Tex, and you can see there's slack in that, in that line. And so I pull that loop out and uh, using a limbus based flap, I expose that area. And then I pass a 10 0 proline, it could be 9 0 as well, but a 10 0 proline partial thickness through the sclera. And then I cut, cut the needle off. And then I pass the very, it's hard to see the proline, but I pass the very tip of, of those tying forceps through that loop. And, I, and then I grab the proline on the other side. And this creates kind of a, a stay suture or a traction suture that, that puts a little bit of stretch on that, that Gore-Tex loop. And I, I would use Gore-Tex to do this, but I, you're, then you will never rotate the knot because uh, the Gore-Tex is too thick to rotate into a lamellar uh, pass. So, so I, I use proline so that I can rotate that knot all the way through and cover it back over with conjunctiva. And now at the end, you can see, I, uh, once I get this tied, that I tap with the, the Westcott scissors, there's, there's no wobble there anymore. I didn't tighten it too much, but it's nice and snug. There's, it's not moving the iris or anything. So I found this to be a helpful way to solve that wobble problem. And it, it's made it, uh, so I, I, I much prefer to err on the side of loose uh, versus the side of tight. Um, so strategies per, for perfect suture tension. So I always suture with infusion on. One time I had an intraoperative uh, fracture when uh, infusion was off and I tied the sutures to what I thought was good tension. And then I turned infusion on at the end of the case and it just broke through the eyelet. So always suture with infusion on. I prefer IOP to be slightly higher than physiologic. That way, when the pressure kind of comes down a little bit, there'll be a little bit of play in, in that line. A bit of wobble can be adjusted. Too much tension is a big problem and will result in an IOL exchange. And then use a slip knot in the second throw. That second throw, you, if you have a slip knot on each side, you can titrate that tension just right. So in conclusion, uh, there are many ways to effectively fixate an eye well in the eye, and none is perfect. The Invista fixation provides many benefits over other techniques. It's important to avoid the pitfalls of improper suture tension to enjoy success. And all that you have to do next is dive in. So I love Mexico. It's a beautiful place. We went to the Yucatan and dove into some of your cenotes. So it's a place that I love. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Uh, wonderful presentation, really, really interesting, really good. Thank you for uh, some of these techniques that solve some of the issues. Uh, before we go to the questions and answers, I would like uh, to bring our, uh, our next fellow, Dr. Montero. She's gonna present your technique using the um, bionic model as well. So. I will ask uh, Dr. Montero to start sharing the screen. And it's a short video also, it's a four minute video. So Dr. Montero, please. Yes.
Again. Porque no puedo. Porque no puedo. No puedo. Comparte lo que no puedo. Me voy para allá. Ok. Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Andrea Montero, and I'm very pleased to present this video with Dr. Ward's IO scleral fixation technique. Uh, in a moment, we will be uh, share the technique. Uh, only a little minute. Mm -hmm. Escucha. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm sorry about the volume, but the uh... Here's the technique.
Thank you very much, uh, Andrea. I'm sorry that the, we had some technical problems with the volume, but I don't. I, uh, what do you think about the video, Matt? Uh, did you? Oh, enjoy? very well done, Andrea. Very, uh, very good job. Excellent video. Thank you. It's fun to see you do it. Excellent. So we we have a, a few questions for Dr. Canabrava and Dr. Ward. I I would like to start asking uh, Sergio. Uh, in your, in your opinion, Sergio, uh, what, or what are you doing to prevent suture, suture exposure? Arturo, can you repeat, please, when you, you talk, the, there, are break, there was a break. Okay, yes, I'm sorry. What do you do to prevent suture exposure? What are you doing now to prevent your, the, the, the flanges of the suture to expose to the, to the conjunctiva. Yes, the, the, the main point in the learn curve is the size of the flange. When you start the flanges techniques, Yamani, Canabrava, or any technique that you use flange, you, is, you try to use a, a big flange. Don't do it. It's important to do a large tunnel a small flange insert it inside the tunnel. If you if you do a large tunnel, a long tunnel, don't don't afraid. The the the, the flange would be inside the tunnel. You don't go back. And it's important too. If you have a patient, for example, with a, a teeny sclera, some patients you with Marfan, you can see there's a teeny sclera. Don't do flange technique. I suggest you use a Gore-Tex, a suture, because if you don't have a good sclera, it's impossible to insert the, the tunnel. And it's in the learn curve. When I start the flange technique, uh, it was difficult because you have afraid, you are afraid to, to do a large tunnel. And uh, Matt, congratulations for your technique, your, your presentation. It was a pleasure to learn for you, my friend. Oh, no, thank you. Thank you, Sid. Mutual. <laughs> I love that you're a mountain biker too, by the way. Uh, Sergio, an another question is, tell us a little bit more about the, the lens that you are developing with uh, Morcher. I mean, I think from what I'm listening here, the IOL is very important, the material and, and the model and you know uh, how resistant the IOL strength, everything. Tell us a little bit more, what are you doing with that lens? Yes, that lens that I'm developing with Mosher is a hydrophobic uh, IOL. And in this moment, you, you are trying to do this IOL to, to perform the four flange technique in two points. But I'm not sure if it's the best way is two points or four points because my technique with four points is really, really, really stable. There's no tilt and you can adjust to it. But uh, I had this idea with this, this, new, this new IOL and I, I had the opportunity in my hospital to, to start this, this, this research and I'm doing this research. It's hydrophobic and for two points in the four flange. Okay, and how do you compare uh, proline sutures to all the optics that are being used with the Jamane technique and what are the advantages of using proline suture instead of doing flange uh, haptics? Uh, I, I have the, the same opinion from the, the, the Matt opinion. Uh, the best uh, technique is the technique that you are more comfortable. Uh, for example, some surgery is more comfortable with uh, glued IOL. Some surgery will be more comfortable with Yamani, with Matt, with mine technique. Uh, you need to try different techniques and it's important you uh, choice your technique because if you repeat the technique, sometimes you'll be with more uh, perfectly because there's not a lot of uh, sclerophic data here, for example, I do about 50. And I, when I, I talk with my friends, uh, do three, four, but I'm a reference for my state. And a lot of tech, uh, sclerophic dates came, came for me. And uh, some 
four points, sometimes more stable. He helped his technique with two points. And I don't have to now, as I told in my, in my, in my presentation, I need more follow-up. I don't have tilt uh, there uh, like their tilt in two, two points technique. It's, it's the, I think this is the great advantage, advantage for the, 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 the problem suture techniques. Okay, I have a question. I mean, there's questions from the audience for both of you. Uh, same question for both of you. Uh, what do you tell us the advantages of anterior chamber maintainer versus posterior maintainer for each of your techniques? And also tell us about the IOL calculation, which is the A constant that you use for the lenses that you are using. So this is for Sergio, and this is for Matt. You can start. Yeah, yeah. so I um, I probably majority use a, a anterior chamber maintainer. I just feel most comfortable. That's how I was trained. Uh, I have on occasion has done pars plant and fusion. Um, and the pars plant, I, I, for the Invista technique, you're not really doing that much inside the eye. So, you know, sometimes it's nice to have a pars plant and fusion if you're doing a lot of maneuvers and the, the cannula is gonna get in the way or something. But for Invista technique, it, it really doesn't ever get in the way. Um, certainly if I'm, I have combined it with DMEC, in which case, um, if it's they've had a vitrectomy, then it is nice to have pars plant infusion um, to unfold the transplant. But um, other than that, I, I think an anterior chamber maintainer, anterior chamber maintainer is fine. Um, the A constant, um, I actually, off the top of my head, I think it's 119.0. It's just the manufacturer's recommended A constant that I use. And I, I set, I set an in, in the bag calculation target about minus point zero point zero point five. Okay, thank you. Uh, so Matt is a, a very avid anterior segment surgeon. I know that you were trained also in retina. So you have retina and anterior segment. So tell no, no, I don't do retina surgery. Oh, you you were not training retina? No, 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 no. Ah, I thought so you are, I, I do. You are yes, okay. but but I, I, I prefer posterior maintainer. I prefer in, in, in my in my hands uh, is more stable. I have more control of the hypotony, and uh, I receive many many patients with. Uh, opa, hello, baby. <laughs> And I, I received many patients with vitrectomy, and uh, you can uh, uh, put a, a, a continuous uh, irrigation. But if the patient there is no uh, vitre previous vitrectomy, you don't uh, put the infusion on. It's important to do a, a, a anterior vitrectomy to avoid to lose vitreous, and you use the maintainer, maintainer only if you have hypotony to avoid to less, uh, to less uh, vitreous. And about the another question was... The, the A constant, which, which is... Uh, yes, uh, I set my, my, my techniques two millimeters from the labels and, I, and my results is more a hy hyper, uh, hypermetropy. And then I, I, uh, I, I use one one degree more one and a half degree more than the 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 the, the target that I, I I find in the in the in the in the results and but for example if a patient there's a, a large uh, astigmatism I prefer to to keep this patient with a, a little hypermetropy. Okay, one question for Matt. Matt. Um, what should we do to avoid, I mean, once you put, I mean, if you have a, the technique, not with the needles, but the technique with the- Yeah, the pull through. The pull through technique, yes. So the question is, how can we ensure that the lens won't go into the vitreous cavity? What, what do you do to prevent that? It seems like, it, because you don't have the, the optics. Yeah. How do you secure the lens? Yeah, it, it's, there's an, I keep the lengths of the Gore-Tex long enough and there's four of them. 
And so once you get the lens injected, it's actually hard. You have to push it into the eye. So okay. it really, there's enough, there's enough friction just on those lengths of suture that, that it doesn't really want to go south. If you, you, if you push it in and it goes too far, it's very easy to pull it back. So it's, 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 I never worry about that. So, so in other words, it's very important to leave that suture long. You want yeah. to go 20 centimeters, more or less, or 20 millimeters. Oh yeah, I mean, I probably, I, let's see, I, I would probably say it's about a, a five to 10 inch. Let's see, what would that be? Maybe 20 centimeters of, of total suture. I mean, you, you can use a big long one because you're just going to be pulling it through and, and then trimming it later. Right. Okay, one question for both. Which, which is the thing that you would like to see improve in each of your techniques? What, what is the next thing? Let, let's say we have like a magical one right now here. What, do, what would you ask for your technique to be improved? Uh, we can start with Matt and then with Sergio. So I would love there to be a little bit more rigid material. So the, the thing that I worry most about with my technique is the suture, the, the eyelet fracture. I thought maybe could there be a PMMA eyelet and the rest of it be acrylic or something like that? Or could there, where there could be a little bit more, um, less risk of, of fracturing, but that, that's probably the, the, the main thing that I would be, I would be wishing for. So you, so you feel that you, that th there should, I mean, there's room to develop better IOLs. I, I think that overall, even for Yamani and for all these lenses, there's room for better, in, uh, specifically design IOLs for scleral fixating uh, uh, intraocular lenses. No question, no question about that. Sergio? In, in my technique, uh, I, I would like to improve it the way to insert the IOL in the eye. I, I really want to, to insert it inside a, a cartridge. For me, use a, a burrata forceps is the, the, the point that I need to improve it in the technique. Excellent. Uh, I don't know if anybody has more questions from the audience. Uh, I think that both presentations are incredibly good. Uh, we started to, uh, to study all the different techniques with our fellows. And as you see, we, we, we have been doing, you know, these wet labs and everything. And both techniques looks very encouraging. Uh, I think both techniques have room uh, so, you know, this is great. I think that unfortunately, every day we will be facing more and more the need for scleral fixating IOLs and also for um, segment, uh, capsular tension segments and rings. So I really thank both of you to uh, bring up you know, all this technology and helping us. And, you know, I hope that once uh, you resume full activities, you will start doing more cases and uh, you will start reporting more results and things like that. So uh, thank you. Thank you very much. I don't know if you want to, each of you wants to, to make more comments. Uh, I see one question here on the side. Someone asked if I've ever broken Gore-Tex suture when I'm trying to bury the knot. That's never happened. I mean, I don't want to say it's indestructible, but Gore-Tex is so strong. You really, I, I don't see that. How you, the, the eyelet and the haptic would break much more, much before you'd break any Gore-Tex. Uh, there's a question here. Do you need complete vitrectomy in each case? I would say no, I, just a good anterior vitrectomy. Uh, I don't go very deep. I just I maybe do some core vitrectomy and try to clear vitreous from the area that I'm going to be working, but I don't do a complete vitrectomy. How about you, Sergio? Uh, Dr. Canabravo, which case do you decide to keep the capsule bag and perform the, the, two, the two flange? Um, I, I always try to 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 keep the the the, the bag first. 
And if I go inside, but all my techniques, I have my retinal surgery colleague with me. All my surgery. It's a, a concern, a tip, a hint, a hint that I, I give for everybody. If you try to use subluxated, to try subluxated cataract surgery, do it together with a, a, a retinal, a retinal surgery. And I, I'll, I tell for all my patients, you have chance to, to need a vitrectomy. And then if you, if I, in, during the surgery, I have it, I lost a lot of the vitrectomy. There's a lot of uh, subluxate during the surgery. Then I change, I remove the, the, the nucleus and perform the, the, the square of fixation. In the same, same time, Sergio, no, uh, sometimes no. If the surgery is a long time, for example, one hour and a half and one hour and 50 minutes, I only remove the nucleus, uh, uh, close the eye, and I do the scleral fixation one month, uh, one month again. And I always tell for my patients, maybe I can't, I can't insert the I, your IOL in the eye in the first surgery, and maybe you need the second time. If you tell it for your patients, they will be calm, the, you don't have problem, and the patient do uh, know how uh, it surgery is difficult, it's hard. Well, this, is, this is very important. Thank you, Sergio, for, for uh, bringing this up. Because sometimes when we go to the, to the meetings and we see all these surgeons doing perfect surgery in video, it's not the same real life and beautiful video. So that's great that you are you know, telling us all this information. And, and it's, it's, I, I agree with you that you know, coming back in a second time, sometimes it's better than trying to push things in the same setting. And also another thing, uh, I, I, I thought you were writing a train, but now that you say no, uh, I think that this technique is bringing together retina surgeons and anterior su segment surgeons. And now we are, you know, becoming one group and that's very nice. Yes, it is, it's really important. It's really important. Matt, do you, how often do you bring a retina surgeon to, to, to these surgeries? Um, so I, if, I, if I'm concerned, so when I evaluate a patient um, before in, in the clinic that has a dislocated lens or I'm not certain about their, their capsular stability, then I will always lay them back. I'll put them, make them supine in the, in the exam lane and then I'll take a pen light and I'll look. And you can usually tell if that lens is drifting posterior, if, it's, if it goes pretty far back and I'm not confident I, I'm gonna be able to go and grasp it, then I will ask one of my retina colleagues to be there with me. Um, but most of the time, if there's something retina, that retina needs to do, I, I have them do that first and then they come to me to get the lens put in. That's great. Sometimes we do combined things as well. Uh, we'll. We'll combine if they need to have silicone oil removed or whatever else. I'm seeing more and more retina surgeons in in different like uh, in different places that they're now very heavy on scleral fixation IOLs, retina vitro retina surgeons. And yeah, I think that's becoming more popular. I think you're right. Yes. That's interesting. Okay, very good. So uh, I think that we cover a lot of things. Uh, Sergio, I know it's very late for you, 11.30 p.m. in Brazil. So you need to go to sleep and you have work tomorrow, correct? No, no, I'm mean, waiting. You, you tell me you, you buy a lunch for me. Are you receive it in my, in my house now? No, you, you tell me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm mean, waiting. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, ne next time I will invite you next time I'll send you some uh, door dash yeah. okay th thank you everybody I mean we had a really good uh, group of uh, participants we had more than 100 I think it's good for this time of, uh, of COVID it's not like Sergio you once had a meeting of 10,000 right so yes the, the world webinar you have in the first day 
8,000 in the second day, uh, 6,000. Yeah, so it, you were lucky because it was at the end of May, I remember. So that was perfect timing. <laughs> because now people are back to work and... Everybody. Yes. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you so much. And I hope to see you soon in person. And really, I appreciate uh, being here and everybody. Uh, muchas gracias a todos que estuvieron aquí con nosotros. Gracias por tener la paciencia algunas cosas tecnológicas y también por este, tener la paciencia de escuchar todo en inglés, pero esto era para eh, darle crédito al doctor Ward y al doctor Canabrava. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much. See you next time. Eh, hasta, hasta luego a todo el mundo. Muchas gracias. Gracias, Arturo. Muchas gracias. Yeah, see you. Nice to see you, Sergio. See you. Have a good night. Bye-bye.